Hello, and welcome to Good Manufacturing Practices for Aseptic Filling of Biopharmaceuticals, presented by American Pharmaceutical Review and sponsored by Wheaton Industries. My name is Mike Okimoto. I'm the Chief Content Officer at Compare Networks, and I will be today's moderator. Before we begin, I'd like to remind our viewers that this event will hold a live question and answer session at the end of the presentations. You can submit a question at any time using the general chat box located on your screen. You can also find documents pertaining to this webinar available in the, uh, for download in the resource list. All right, so allow me to introduce today's first presenter. As a member of the scientific community for 10 years, Jeffrey Reed earned his chemistry, chemistry degree from the University of Delaware and his MBA from Goldie Beacom College. Jeff started his career working on the development of submicron particles for HPLC columns, specializing in several different chemical reactions. Jeff's also worked as a product manager at Buki Corporation, specializing in laboratory technologies and techniques such as pressurized solvent extraction, automated solvent extraction, and solid phase extraction. Currently, Jeff works at Wheaton Industries as a global market manager where his main focus is finding solutions for customers in the pharmaceutical industry. At this time, I'd like to invite Jeff to join the webinar. Welcome. Hello, everyone, and welcome. First and foremost, I want to thank everyone for joining today's webinar on good manufacturing practices for septic filling of biopharmaceuticals. As mentioned earlier, I'm Jeff Freed. I'm a global market manager for Wheaton Industries. If you're not familiar with Wheaton Industries, we supply primary packaging components to the pharmaceutical industry. We supply these in a variety of different material compositions from glass to plastic, but we also supply these ready to use through our premium service offering. One of the services we do offer is sterilization, and sterilization will be the focal point on my uh, presentation today. I'm going to start off with an introduction of the overall webinar, which will provide you with the meaning of sterility and two ways a drug product can be processed. I'll then get into the three different sterilization methods, which are chemical, radiation, and steam sterilization. I'll provide you with a background of each one, some typical process and parameters for each one, and then the advantages and disadvantages for each one. After this, I want to touch on the different material compositions that can be utilized for primary packaging components. I have these categorized in five groups, which are glass, plastic, rubber, metal, and paper. Out of these five groups, I want to take out the two most commonly used material compositions for packaging drug products, which are glass and plastic. I want to then take these material compositions and provide you with a compatibility guide which will give you insight on specific methods that should be utilized when sterilizing these material compositions. After this, we'll have our polling session. I'm very excited to have Prima here. Prima works for Goodwin Biotechnology, and she has elected to use Wheaton pre-sterilized vials, so I'm very excited to hear about her processes and applications. Prima's going to start off by complying with regulatory guidelines, how you can lower the risk in the most critical step in the manufacturing of biologics. She's going to then decipher between a manual and semi-automated aseptic filling process for fragile proteins. At the end, we'll summarize everything up and then we'll have her questions. The meaning of sterile. Sterility can be defined as a product that is free from bacteria or other microorganisms. This can be achieved by applying the proper combination of heat, chemicals, irradiation, pressure, or filtration. Now, it's impossible to say you can achieve absolute sterility. To do so, you would have to test every article and every batch. And this is impossible due to the fact that sterility testing is a destructive test. Therefore, the sterility assurance level is utilized, which is known as SAL. SAL is the probability of a non-sterile product making its way through a validated sterilization process. The FDA requires that you cannot have more than one non-sterile product in a million making its way through a sterilization process. 
USP Chapter 71, titled The Sterility Test, outlines the two test methods that are applied for sterility testing. The first is membrane filtration. This is most common for pharmaceuticals, and it is the standard for large volume fills. And the second is direct inoculation, which is mostly common for medical devices. As mentioned earlier, there's two ways a drug product can be processed. The first is aseptic processing, and the second is terminal processing. Aseptic processing is when the drug product and the primary packaging components are all sterilized separately and then brought together at the end. It's important to note the material composition of the primary packaging component on what sterilization method is going to be utilized. An example would be plastic. Not all plastics can be steam sterilized due to the high temperatures of an autoclave, whereas glass vials or glass bottles, no matter the type of glass, any type of glass can be steam sterilized due to the durability of the glassware. Terminal sterilization is when the product, container, closure, all have low bio burden, but it's not completely sterile. The product's put in the final container with its closure, and it undergoes the sterilization process all together. This webinar will specifically be on aseptic processing. There are three different types of sterilization methods. There's chemical sterilization, which is done through ethylene oxide. It can either be pure or dilute ethylene oxide, depending on your safety concerns. There's steam sterilization, which is done via an autoclave. And then there's irradiation sterilization, which can either be done by gamma or electron beam. Now, earlier I mentioned that it's the material composition does play a factor. However, there's other criteria that, uh, that also plays a factor that I'll touch on shortly into this webinar. Let's start with chemical sterilization. As I just mentioned, it's done by ethylene oxide gas. It's very similar to an autoclave as the product is put into a vacuum sealed chamber. The ethylene oxide gas acts as an alkylating agent that actually destroys the DNA of microorganisms. It can either be pure or dilute ETO. So if you're utilizing dilute ethylene oxide, it's important to make sure the mixture of inert gas is around 10 to 15 percent. Now, chemical sterilization is mostly common when you're working with a heat-sensitive material such as a plastic that has a low melting point due to the fact that chemical sterilization is not a high heat sterilization method. Here are the typical process parameters for chemical sterilization. You want to make sure the gas quantity is over 400 milligrams per liter. The temperature is only roughly around 45 degrees Celsius. That's roughly around 20 degrees Celsius above room temperature, so you can see it's not a high heat sterilization method. The relative, relative humidity, you want to keep around 35%, and the exposure time is very dependent on your load, and it can vary anywhere from 90 to 360 minutes, and you'll find later on into this webinar that that is a pretty extended um, exposure time. So that is definitely a disadvantage, is disadvantage of chemical sterilization. Now let's get into the advantages and disadvantages of chemical sterilization. Uh, the first advantage, I already mentioned this earlier, the fact that it is a low temperature sterilization method, meaning you can uh, pretty much put any material, it's compatible with any material no matter the melting point which means it's not going to corrode plastic metals or rubber materials. And it's very efficient as it destroys all types of microorganisms, including ones that are resistant to spores. Disadvantages, again, it's a long cycle time. Also, ethylene oxide is a carcinogen, and it is flammable, so there are safety concerns. There's also a post-aeration process, and this post-aeration process is meant 
to eliminate any residual ethylene oxide that could be left in the primary packaging component itself. So it's important to factor in this post-aeration process as well when you're looking at uh, time for a sterilization method. Now let's get into steam sterilization. Instead of ethylene oxide gas, there's actually heated moisture that is utilized. The heated moisture destroys microorganisms by denaturing the enzymes in the structural proteins. Therefore, it's the effect of temperature and moisture that actually kills off the microorganisms. Now, this is a high temperature sterilization method, so you do not want to use materials that are heat sensitive. It's uh, critical to note that you can use empty wear or sealed wear. And I'll touch on this shortly. Probably, it's actually my next slide where I actually compare and give you a quick tip. Um, and also, there's three critical variables for steam sterilization. It's time, temperature, and pressure. This takes me to my quick tip one. If you are utilizing a lined closure, please make sure you take in consideration the adhesive in the liner. Again, this is a high temperature sterilization method, so if the liner is not compatible with high temperatures, it will cause particulate matter into the, uh, enter into either the end product or the primary packaging component itself. Here are the typical process parameters for steam sterilization. The temperature is 121 degrees Celsius, which is much higher than chemical sterilization, which is 45 degrees Celsius. The pressure is 15 PSI, and the exposure time is roughly 20 minutes, depending on how many cycles you tend to do with your load, which you can see is much shorter than chemical sterilization. Quick tip number two, if you do use um, a closed cap wear inside of an autoclave, it's critical to ensure that the cap is loosely tightened on the glass container, and that's due to the fact that glass is an amorphous structure, so when it's heated, it actually expands. If the cap is on too tight, you can actually cause the glass to break within the autoclave. Now let's get into the advantages and disadvantages of steam sterilization. Advantages, it is non-toxic and safe as you're not utilizing a chemical such as ethylene oxide. The cycle is easy to control and monitor, and again, it's rapid cycle time of only 20 minutes. The disadvantage is that it's not compatible with heat sensitive materials due to the fact that it is a high temperature sterilization method and it can cause leachates with repeated exposure. So let's take polypropylene for an example. If you repeat repeatedly uh, steam sterilize polypropylene, you are going to affect its extractables profile and then you can actually uh, have leachates occur in the end product. Lastly, let's get into irradiation, and this is specifically gamma irradiation. This works as high-energy photons are emitted via an isotope source. It's usually cobalt-60, and the cobalt-60 actually destroys the DNA in living cells. It's a very effective sterilization process because it actually breaks the covalent bond of the bacteria's DNA. However, there are some effects it can have on uh, both plastic and glass. And the plastic, it it's more dependent on what type of plastic it is. I'll touch on this shortly. Some of the effects for plastic, it could cause it to become more brittle. It could cause a color change. It could cause it to stiffen and even soften. Whereas glass, specifically gamma irradiation, can cause the glass to change its color. Here are the advantages and disadvantages for gamma irradiation. It is deep penetration power. Again, it breaks the covalent bond of the bacteria's DNA. There's very few process parameters. It is also a low temperature process, and there's no residuals. So that means there's no post-aeration process. Disadvantages is the fact that not all materials are compatible, and I'll touch on this shortly as well. 
So at this point, I provided everyone with a background on the three different types of sterilization methods. I provided you with the typical process parameters and also the advantages and disadvantages. So now I want to get into the different material compositions that can make up primary packaging components. Again, I have them outlined in these five categories, which are glass, plastics, rubber, metal, and paper. Now, the two most commonly used material compositions for packaging drug products are glass and plastic. So I want to single these out and for the rest of my uh, session provide you with what I want to call a sterilization guide, which is going to give you insight on how these material compositions should be sterilized. But real quickly, I just want to give you some examples of primary packaging components for glass. I have outlined ampules, vials, and bottles. Now there's many more. There's also syringes, cartridges, but um, I didn't want to put every single one, but you can also, it's the same for these um, primary packaging components as well. For plastics, it's closures, bottles, and tubes. And again, there's many more, but I just wanted to give you the three most common. Now let's get into the compatibility guide with glass and plastic. I want to start with glass. There's two types of glass. There's type 1 borsilicate glass, which has your highest hydrolytic resistance, and it's your most durable glass. Then you have your type 3 glass, which is known as soda lime glass. This has your lowest hydrolytic resistance, and it's your least uh, durable glass. Let's start with chemical sterilization. You can see both glass types are compatible with it. Steam sterilization, they're both compatible with it, but if you look at type 3, there's a note 1. And the note 1 is saying that the steam sterilization can affect its extractables profile. And this is due to the fact that type 3 glass is not as durable as type 1. Lastly, look at irradiation, specifically gamma. For type 1 and type 3 glass, there is a color change that can occur depending on the killer rays that you actually hit the glassware with. Now, this isn't every type of glass. There's also type 2 glass and there's type NP glass. If you want a full list in the effects of sterilization methods that are, or could happen with that, those glass types, please feel free to reach out to me after the webinar and I can um, give you some insight on that as well. In this experiment here, I wanted to really show you how steam sterilization can affect type 3 glass. I have in this table the elements that can come out of glass. These are inorganic elements that can come out of glass. On the left-hand side, you can see it's sodium, magnesium, aluminum, potassium, calcium, iron, zinc, baryon, silicon, and titanium. Now, what I did here is I put ultra-purified water at a pH of 7 inside of type 1 and type 3 glass, and I actually... Um, autoclaved it for 60 minutes at 121 degrees Celsius. And what happens here, I put it through an analytical test known as ICP-OES, which stands for Ionic Coupling Plasma Optical Emission Spectroscopy. And you can see that the elemental extractables for sodium, calcium, and silicon are much more in type 3 glass, I have this highlighted in yellow, than in type 1 glass. So again, it's just showing you that the steam sterilization can affect the extractable profile in type 3 glass. And the results of this are all in parts per million. I also mentioned that both type 1 glass and type 3 glass can cause color change when gamma irradiated, and that's due to its amorphous structure. Uh, glass, borsilicate glass, or soda lime glass constantly, since it's a morphic structure, has bonds and atoms shifting around into the entirety of the molecule. What happens is that the gamma rays will cause the silicon atoms to shift, and bonds can become loose. Therefore, the surrounding electrons will actually interact with the energy from the gamma rays, and it will cause clear glass to become more pale and almost an amber color. However, it's important to note that the final product is not radioactive and it's not contaminated in any way. This takes me to my last quick tip of the session is the fact that the color change is reversible 
when it's introduced to annealing temperatures. And I'll show that in this slide here. What I have is on the left a molded container that actually was gamma irradiated. It was originally clear. And you can see it changed color from clear to this amber color. We annealed it roughly around 600 uh, degrees Celsius, and it was able to turn back to its original color. Now, this is something you would never do. It's just an experiment we wanted to do to show that um, sterilization methods can affect different material compositions and that heat does play an important role with material compositions. Now I want to get through plastic and do the same thing I just did with glass. In this table, on the left-hand side, I have the most commonly used plastics. I have first your polyethylenes, your cyclic olefin copolymer, your polypropylene, your PC, your PET, nylon, PVC. I uh, compared each one of these plastics with the actual sterilization method. And you can see each one is compatible with the chemical sterilization. And that's due to the fact that chemical sterilization is a low temperature sterilization process. Now, if you look at steam, you can see your polyethylenes, your PETs, and your PVCs are not compatible with steam sterilization due to their lower melting point. So if you actually put this these materials in an autoclave, you can actually cause them to degrade over time. Um, lastly, specific, specifically gamma irradiation, when it comes to polyvinyl chloride, PVC, it will cause a color change in this. So that's something we need to take into note as well when you're selecting a sterilization method. Now again, this isn't all the plastics. There's many more plastics. There's cyclic olefin polymer, and um, you could go on, PTFE, there's, there's many more. But if you want a list of how um, a specific plastic that you may be working with, how the sterilization method affects it, again, please reach out to me, and uh, I'll get an answer to your question. When it comes to gamma irradiations, there are three ways in which it can affect specific polymers. The first is chain scission. That actually results in a reduced tensile strength and it elongates the plastic, which means it makes the plastic more loose and more durable, which not, it's not a good case for um, depending on one's application. Second is cross-linking, which results in increased tensile strength and reduced elongation, which means it makes the plastic more durable and it makes it more rigid. And again, that's not good for specific applications. Lastly, that can cause a color change. When you're actually manufacturing plastics, there are stabilizers and modifiers that are actually put into the resin to help in the fabrication process. Now, the gamma irradiation can interact with these stabilizers and actually turn the color of the plastic, and it's usually a yellow color it turns. So what I want to do now on this last slide is pretty much um, go over the key considerations for determining correct sterilization methods. This is some. I touched on majority of these. But again, it's not just the chemical composition of the material, material you want to um, sterilize, but there's other factors that should, be, should come into play, one being product release. You can see irradiation and steam, they both have immediate dosimetric releases. However, chemical, again, there is a post-aeration process that removes the residual ethylene oxide that could be put into the, that could be left behind on the primary packaging component. When it comes to penetration, all three uh, methods do, pe do have complete penetration. However, chemical, you need to make sure you're using a gas permeable packaging when you're actually performing the sterilization method. Material compatibility, irradiation, it's most materials. However, it's not compatible with PVC and PTFE. Steam sterilization, it's most, most materials. However, it's not your polyethylenes which are your HDPE or your LDPE or your PET. Also, you need to take into consideration the cap in the liner as well if you're doing steam sterilization, again, because it's a high 
temperature sterilization method. Now, chemical sterilization, majority of the materials are compatible with it, again, because it's a low temperature sterilization method, and if you re recall, it's only roughly around 45 degrees Celsius. Now, residuals, the only method that has residuals are the, is the chemical sterilization method, and that's why the post-aeration process is required. So at this time, I want to say thank you. This is for my part. We can get into the uh, polling questions with Michael, and then Prima can uh, go through her part, her session. Great. Thank you, Jeff. So as uh, Jeff just mentioned, we are, before we bring on the next speaker, we're going to have uh, three quick polling questions. Uh, the first is, that's uh, a true or false question. Uh, aseptic processing can be defined as when the drug product container and closure are subjected to sterilization processes separately and then brought together. Is that a true statement or a false statement? So we're going to leave this up for just uh, uh, you know half a minute to a minute uh, to allow the results to come in. If you could please just check uh, true or false. Um, we will uh, we will wait for the results to get to come in. Okay, we're going to give this about 10 more seconds. Once again, the question is true or false? Aseptic processing can be defined as when the, drug when the drug product, container, and closure are subjected to sterilization processes separately and then brought together. Is that a true or a false statement? All right. Thank you for participating. We're going to go to the results of this poll question, uh, and then we have two more quick questions afterwards. So Jeff, it looks like uh, about 90% of the audience believe that uh, this is a true statement. Absolutely. So aseptic processing is when the primary packaging and the drug product are all sterilized separately, then put together. Terminal processing is when the drug product and the primary packaging components are all filled and put into the um, sterilization process all at once, all together at one time. All right. Okay, let's get to the next question. Uh, what sterilization or which of these sterilization methods are not heat resistant? What sterilization method is non-heat resistant? The answers, the, the, the choices are steam, chemical, irradiation, or all of the above. So again, we'll just leave this up here for... Uh, for a few seconds, uh, if you in the audience could go ahead and answer the question, what sterilization method is non-heat resistant? Okay. Let's take a look at the results here. Uh, okay. It looks like uh, it, there's no one clear winner, Jeff. Uh, Steam seems to it, be the the, the winner. <laughs> and, and Michael, it is steam sterilization. And for the audience, I kind of tricked you on it with the wording of that. I can see how it can get a little how how it's worded. It's a little tricky, but steam sterilization is um, it's not heat non heat resistant, meaning that if you put a uh, primary packaging component that is heat resistant. Um, non-heat resistant, then you don't want to utilize steam sterilization due to the fact that steam sterilization is um, roughly 121 degrees Celsius, and again, it'll degrade the, um, the primary packaging component. But I have it worded to try to throw a little bit of a curveball to the audience. <laughs> Keeping everyone on their toes. All right. <laughs> okay, so the last polling question. It's another true or false question. 
The aeration step during ETO sterilization is meant to eliminate residual EO emissions. Is that a true or a false statement? Yeah, I'm going to leave it up here for just a couple of seconds in order for everyone to have time to go ahead and submit their answers. <clears throat> All right. The question is, true or false, the aeration step during ETO sterilization is meant to eliminate residual EO emissions. Is that a true or a false statement? And the winner is true. The vast majority of the audience feels that that is a true statement. Jeff? So that's um, that's something you need to take in consideration if you do uh, elect to use um, chemical sterilization. Is not only is the um, cycle times long, but there's also a post aeration process. So just something else to take into uh, factor when you're trying to choose um, your sterilization method for your uh, specific application. Great. All right. Well, at this point, uh, Jeff, thank you. I'd like to bring on our next speaker. Um, with over 20 years of experience in managing quality assurance and quality control departments, Prima Rathina Vilu leveraged a solid scientific background with technical experience in biochemistry, microbiology, and chemistry, working on all aspects of early stage drug development including analytical method development and validation, as well as establishing product specifications. She has a deep understanding of USP and EP methodologies, which enables her to provide guidance and oversight for the release and testing of API, finished product, and raw materials, while assuring her quality systems and standard operating procedures are in compliance with even the most stringent of requirements. Uh, she also assists with ID submissions and in preparing CMC sections of regulatory submission documents. Prima attended the University of Madras, where she earned a master's degree in biochemistry and an undergraduate degree in chemistry, and has published several research papers in reputable peer-reviewed biological journals. Welcome, Prima. Thank you, Mike, for the introduction. Thank you, everyone, for attending this webinar. Today's presentation covers the following topics. Overview of manual semi-automated filling. What are the challenges during aseptic filling? Overview of fill qualification and advantages of using the pre-sterilized wires and the end good means capability in fill finish. Fill finish. What is a fill finish? The fill finish is the last step the fill finish is the last step of the injectable drug manufacturing process. Demand for fill finish product for clinical trials is increasing globally due to increasing in drug candidates entering for clinical trials phase 1, phase 2, phase 3. Fill finish is subjected to extreme scrutiny by regulatory agencies. Fill finish is a key rate limiting step for distributing the drug to the market for clinical trial. Risk of the failure can be costly because fill finish is the rate, li rate limiting step. It is at the end of the process, so it is very costly if there is a failure. M manual semi-automated filling operation. This is the picture of the manual semi-automated filling operation at Goodwin Biotechnology, which is being conducted in class 100 room. Let's go over principle of manual semi-automated filling operation. Manual semi-automated aseptic filling operations differ substantially from automated operations. The differences pose unique operational and evaluation challenges, especially with biologics. The challenges and constraints must be considered thoroughly when designing evaluation procedures for the manual semi-automated operations in order to yield high-quality sterile products. 
manual semi automated com typically composed of filling with a semi automated pump to a pump of pipe to manually closing of the container greatest risk by operated manipulations have a direct impact on the sterility of the wild drug product process consideration should include qualified time frame temperature etc which may pose risk to product quality and integrity the advantages let's go over the advantages of manual semi automated filling the aseptic fill finish methods can vary between an early clinical phase hand fill to a small volume semi automated filling to a fully automated high volume over multiple day production batches what are all the advantage of your manual semi automated aseptic filling there will be a minimal loss of the product due to shorter filling line and there is a flexibility in filling small batches you can fill from 50 up to 2000 vials and filling fragile sear sensitive products and it can be quick change over between the batches because most of the materials used for filling are disposable let's go over the challenges on making the manual semi automated filling the greatest source of microbial contamination during the process or operational integrity of the clean room and personal activities performance deviations or failures are linked to complex aseptic filling processing task the continuous span of time during which an operator carries out repetitive aseptic technique the expected rate of activity and unexpected intervention intervention such as spillage or power loss or hvac failure other challenges are personal training and qualifications are critical it is very critical for manual semi automated fill process operators must successfully demonstrate their ability to adhere to stringent aseptic techniques the process relies heavily on the individual operator's basic comprehension and execution of the aseptic technique all personnel must be individually qualified they should be able to preserve the protein's 3d structure maintain aseptic conditions and distinguish between inherent protein properties and extrinsic particulate defects upon visual inspection let's go over what are all the goals of aseptic processing demonstrate the ability to prevent the contamination of sterile materials during processing while preserving the native state of biologically active protein demonstrate that aseptic processing can be consistently achieved under the specified operational configuration activities and conditions these goals are applicable to both the manual and automated aseptic operation as well as whether the fill size is small or large scale media fill what is media fill media fill is the performance of an aseptic manufacturing procedure using a sterile microbiological growth medium in place of the drug solution to test or to qualify or to confirm whether the aseptic procedures are adequate to prevent contamination during actual drug production key element in aseptic processing evaluation mimic actual filling process simulation using the media or broth broth fills media fill protocol should be designed to meet regulatory requirements which is an integral tool to identify risk factors and failures have to be evaluated to mitigate the risk for media fill qualification or any fill the components have to be washed using the wfi 
and or sanitized and then sterilized using the autoclave or depyrogenate the glass wires and filled in class 100 room and stopper and seal using the sterile liquid medium once they are filled they should be incubated uh, in two different temperature lower temperature 20 to 25 degrees for 7 days and 30 to 35 degrees for another 7 days total number of days incubated will be 14 days at the end the t- test will be read and then the results will be provided and at the end of 14 days some of the control wires have to be inoculated with the microorganism in order to confirm that during the fill nothing is being compromised to identify if there is any contamination during the fill why is the validation of aseptic process required what is a sterile product sterile product is defined as free of viable microorganism it is not practical to examine every unit or wire for confirmation of sterility because biological material drug product cannot go through 100% sterilization as jeff mentioned so we have to make sure the media fill qualification is done in the such a way that it assures adequate to prevent contamination during actual drug production in order to mitigate the risk all efforts must be concentrated on minimizing the risk of contamination for example we have to have proper system for maintaining the air handling system robust cleaning procedure of the clean rooms and robust monitoring program and stringent training of the operators who performs the media fill or the product fill knowledge alone is not is insufficient operators must be able to demonstrate the theoretical knowledge to practical application operator must be able to demonstrate proficiency in aseptic governing and technique consistently perform operations without contamination and or compromise the quality risk management what are the risk manual semi automated process typically involve greater risk than automated aseptic process for preventing contamination automated system may introduce other problems like shear effects on fragile proteins due to the pump speed cross contamination with the rotary piston pumps dosing variations with viscous or high concentration product a risk based quality management management system is necessary for both the manual semi automated process as well as this automated process these are the reference for aseptic fill processing let's talk about thoughts on using pre sterilized vials what are all the advantages of using pre sterilized vial we get documentation on sterility assurance less documentation for vial preparation we don't need to have expensive washing and sterilizing equipment to own or to validate the equipment to maintain the equipment and train the operator to use less manufacturing space if we purchase the pre sterilized vials and smaller use of water for injection no production scheduling or washing and sterilizing components and pre sterilized vials are well packaged there are few minor disadvantages because the pre sterilized vials are expensive at times we have to long lead item by evaluating the pros and cons goodwin has elected to use pre sterilized vials for aseptic fill now we go over the goodwin capabilities since 1992 goodwin has focused on two core capabilities as a contract development and manufacturing organization mammalian cell culture development and cgmp manufacturing goodwin is a one stop shop 
from cell line development to manufacturing toxicology material and GMP clinical trial supplies. And we also have capabilities on bioconjugation services from proof of concept to process development and CGMP manufacturing using antibody drug conjugates, radioimmunoconjugates, peptide immunoconjugate, etc. Goodwin also have a capability on performing the stability study as per ICH guidelines. For more than 24 years, Goodwin has provided aseptic fill and finish services for biopharmaceutical clients in USA, Europe, and Canada. All services are performed with a semi-automated pump, giving Goodwin great flexibility that allows wide range of batch sizes and fill volumes. Services are delivered in a wide range of packaging systems and to a large array of product types. Our manual techniques offers great flexibility to meet most of our clients' requirements. Our expertise lies in fill and finish of biologicals such as monoclonal antibodies, proteins, peptides, vaccines, and bioconjugates. Available primary packaging and fill volumes. Goodwin performs aseptic fill and finish activities with ready-to-fill bulk or performs the compounding of the bulk itself. All sterile filtration and fill finish activities are performed in ISO 5 clean rooms. Goodwin provides customized, economical and liquid vial filling under CGMP conditions. Goodwin accommodates small-scale aseptic fills that may not meet the minimum vial requirement of other aseptic fill companies. We are fully validated for batch sizes up to 2,000 vials and volumes of 0.5 ml to 10 ml per vial. We are also validated for 800 vials per shape in 50 ml vials. We can also validate other filling requirements. Goodwin uses a semi-automated pump with a needle or using an append of piper to aseptic fill metal-sensitive products, for example, bioconjugated material. Goodwin supports a variety of finished dosage liquids for Phase 1, Phase 2, and Phase 3 clinical trials. We have filling components preparation capabilities also, which includes while washing, sterilization or deep pyrogenation, and QC microbiological testing. Goodwin also have experience with customized and specialized fills. For example, light sensitive products, cytotoxic products, fragile products such as recombinant proteins. Goodwin also has capability in cartridge filling. Thank you. Thank you, Rima. We are now going to move on to the question and answer portion of the uh, webinar. You can uh, submit questions at any time uh, on your console. So let's get to the questions right away. Okay, first question. Uh, the first question, Jeff, I think is for you. Uh, and what is the risk of ETO residual left in plastics? If you have ethylene oxide um, left into plastics or even glass, it is a carcinogen which will definitely um, could harm the end user. That's why it's critical if you are doing uh, chemical sterilization to make sure it's a validated process and that there's um, there's there's repeated uh, validation being done to make sure that the residuals are are eliminated now I'll be honest a lot of um, and a lot of our business as well is moving more away from chemical sterilization we can still do that but um, 
due to the safety concerns, it's I'm seeing an increase in autoclave and irradiation sterilization. Great. Okay. Uh, Prima, a question for you. Can someone speak to the labeling requirements of the primary packaging container, glass versus plastics, with respect to label material, ink material, and adhesive material with regards to leaching versus food grade? Prima, if, if would you be able to answer this, or would you want me to answer this? It's up to you. You, uh, you can answer. So, also at Wheaton, we do do uh, barcoding. Uh, we are working with someone, actually CompuType, um, very uh, knowledgeable when it comes to barcoding. Um, and we're finding that when you talk about extractables and leachables, that there's four major sources. Obviously, it's a primary packaging component. It's the inline process. And also, it could be the secondary uh, packaging or label or ink adhesive. So I know CompuType is personally working with technology that um, eliminates the potential threat of leachables. For that question, I would love you to email me and let me work with uh, the contacts that I have at CompuType to really get you a thorough answer. Um, to your to your uh, question, due to the fact that um, that is a partner we work with, and um, so far being uh, working with primary packaging, it's by far the uh, the most reliable and knowledgeable source because they've been doing it so long. So, for a complete answer, please email me directly. I'm hoping Michael will put our emails up as well, and um, I can actually get you in contact with. Um, with the contact I work with as well. Yeah, um, and, and just uh, so that everybody knows, if uh, any questions that we don't get to uh, will be answered via email, and so um, uh, these questions can be addressed, Jeff, uh, via email um, after the webinar is, is completed. Uh, okay, I think the next question, though, is uh, for you, Jeff, and it is, uh, what about polypropylene is changed to make it radiation grade? So it's it's critical if you are irradiating polypropylene um, by gamma irradiation, you must make sure that it meets PF 511, which uh, is a whole, um, homopolymer resin. So you need to, if you're buying, um, let's say, a a packaging component or even a, a well plate, I, I hear this a lot with well plates because m majority of well plates are made out of polypropylene, is to make sure it meets PF 511. And it's due to the fact that the resin is uh, meets a specific criteria. And if it meets a, that specific criteria, criteria of PF 511, then it actually is uh, grade A poly uh, polypropylene. All right, great. Now, Prima, this next question is for you. Can mm -hmm. Goodwin perform sterile filling of small molecule drugs also for clinical trials? Yes, we have a capabilities. As long as it's a biologic, we have only liquid uh, fill, so we have the capability. All right. Uh, let's see. Jeff, another question for you. What radiation dosage will change the color of glass, and what type of dosage did it take to change the color of the glass in the example? Great question. So the standard is anywhere from 25 to 60 kilorays, and we actually hit the glass within those uh, standards. So it's not like we um, went overboard and hit it with 100 kilorays. We hit it roughly around 50 to 55 kilorays, um, which is within the standard, and we were able to uh, change the color of the glass. Um, but again, you can. It's it's important to note that it it's not radioactive. It's not contaminated. The only downside is that it could af affect your marketing capabilities. So, if you develop a drug and you want to sell it into, let's say, a clear container, um, and you opted to use um, 
uh, gamma irradiation, then you have to take into concept that I instead of a clear container, your customer may be getting a, a pale, palish, uh, amber color container. So just something to take into consideration. And as I mentioned, you can change the color back. But um, again, that, that, that's something you would never do. It's just an experiment we wanted to do at Wheaton. So anyway, the, the, the answer to the question is uh, 50 to 55 kilorays, and I even believe that you could change the color of glass even lower than that, hitting it with gamma irradiation. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Um, Freeman, another question for you. Could you confirm how many media filled tests we need to perform per process? Also, do you need to do it per vial size? For example, our maximum batch size is 500 vials of two mils, of two mil vials. Do we need to repeat media fill testing if our max batch size for five mil vials is 250 units? We have to do media fill qualification consecutively three runs, but we can have the bracketing with the different sizes. For example, you can have a one ml, 5 ml and 10 ml bracketing, and we have to make sure that qualification is done for the number of wires you are filling your product. For example, you were the fill size or the batch size is 500, you have to have a media fill qualification done at least for 500, or I would recommend to do up, up to 600, because if you have what, if you have the product to be filled 510, you don't want to be less than what you have, what you are qualified for. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Um, Jeff, here we go. Another question for you. What are the product pH limitations of type 1 and type 3 glass? Great question. So, this gets you into how a drug product can interact with glass and the different types of glass. Obviously, type 1 has your highest hydrolytic resistance, meaning it's less likely to interact with the drug product. Now, we're coming out with a Wheaton rule of thumb. Um, if anybody's attending Interfex, I'll be giving a poster presentation on this. And um, you can see there, there's three ways a product can interact with glass. There's the ion exchange, and this happens at more acidic environments. However, there's also um, attack via the hydroxyl group, which happens at high pHs. So what I recommend that is if you have a, pH, a drug product with a pH of 8 or less, you can utilize um, tubular glass um, vials. If you get up to around 9 or 10, it's more advantageous to utilize molded containers, and that's due to the fact how they're manufacture, manufactured. Tubular vials are manufactured via a two-step process, meaning they're heated up once with the tube and then cooled down and then reheated to actually form the flat bottom and the serum finish. Whereas the molded containers, it's just a one-step process, so you're, you're less likely to have um, interaction at high pHs. Now, when you get to a pH of over 10, it's something you, you don't want to utilize glass at that point because you have to take into the consideration of something called silicon dissolution. And what happens is the OH group will actually inter, inter, interact with the silicon and oxygen group and dissolve the actual bond. And then you have silicon into your end drug product. And that's also known, I'm sure everybody on the phone um, has heard this term, delamination. And that's been a big topic over the past uh, couple years in primary packaging. So um, again, if you're at Interfex, stop by uh, our poster session and I, I'll really go into detail because I can talk uh, you know, for a whole other webinar on this. But um, anyway, when you get to a pH of 10 plus, it's not advantageous to utilize glass. You want to utilize something else. Um, anywhere from 9 to 8, you want to utilize molded containers, which is type 1. And then when you have anything less than 8, you want to utilize tubular vials. Great. I think we have time for one more question. Um, and Jeff, I think this one's directed at you. 
um, which is, do you have any experience in gamma irradiation of COC polymers, such, um, and have you seen things such as color change or any impact to the product? Ah, great. Another great question. Yes, um, COC, when it, and it depends, yep, gamma irradiation will. We found that, and it's dependent on where you're getting the resin from, uh, and the thing is, there's not too many uh, manufacturers of uh, cyclic olefin copolymer resin. Um, however, it's, uh, it is dependent on what is put into the resin. But yes, when you gamma irradiate COC, you can have it change a yellowish color. Now, we've done a little bit of an experiment on hitting it with a killer ray. I, I believe it was anywhere from 25 to 35 and we were able to change the color to yellow but the color actually turned back to its transparent self within uh, seven days so uh, hopefully that answers your question it's it's not as straightforward but um yes gamma radiation will change the color of coc it is associated with the resin as well though and most of the time it will turn back to its original color over time, whereas glass will not. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have uh, for, for questions. Any questions that were not, we were not able to address here live will be answered by our panelists via email. So, uh, uh, you know, again, thank you for participating and thank you for, uh, for submitting questions. Um, we'd also like to thank our presenters, uh, Jeff Reed and Prima Rathina Vilu, um, for sharing their knowledge with us. And uh, we want to offer a special thank you to Wheaton Industries for sponsoring today's event. This, uh, this webinar will be available uh, on demand on the AmericanPharmaceuticalReview.com website. Again, thank you to all our participants. Uh, thank you to our presenters. And stay tuned for more webinars. Thanks. <laughs>